Come to the second les lesson in a series of lessons that we're preaching again after several years called The Voice of Satan. And in this lesson, we look at Satan speaking to God about Job. In the previous lesson, we looked at Satan speaking to Eve. And then in the third lesson, the Lord willing, Satan speaking to Jesus the Son of God, and then, finally, in the fourth lesson, resisting Satan's voice today. And we note that Satan has only spoken three times uh, that we know of revealed in the Scripture, and the first time that he spoke was the only time that he spoke to someone entirely human, and that was Eve. And we saw what he did in relation to Eve, Satan being the liar and the murderer that he is. He denied the goodness of God. And then he did, saying that God was preventing Eve from eating from all the trees in the garden, which was a lie. He denied the severity of God, say, saying that Eve would not die if she partook of the forbidden fruit, and that was a lie because spiritually but they became separated uh, from God on that day that they did eat. And then he slanders the motive of God because he says that God is keeping you from something wonderful by forbidding you from eating the, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that was a lie as well. And so we see the craftiness of Satan from the very beginning, and we see the destructive results of Adam and Eve submitting to Satan, even down to this very day in time. But the second time that he speaks, Satan slanders a man. He slanders a man named Job. Specifically, he slanders Job to God. And the main idea of Satan's attack against Job is, does Job fear God for nothing? In other words, if all material blessings and health were taken away, would Job still fear God? In other words, Job is simply serving God. Satan says that Job is simply serving God for those material things in health. And if those things were taken away, then Job would stop serving God. And then God affirms Job's righteousness. God said that Job is a righteous man. And God permits Satan to take away Job's family, wealth, and health, but limits him from taking Job's life. And so we have much interesting things about Job and about Satan speaking to God about him and what happens. Job was a righteous man, materially blessed by God. Job was a wonderful man who feared God and turned away from evil, and God blessed him in so many ways. In Job 1 and verse 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil, Seven sons and three daughters were born to him, so he had ten children. His possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And I said this many times, that what was remarkable about Job is also he served God when God was blessing him so much with health and material things. 
And many times when God blesses us with health and material things, we forget about God and we become more lax in our service to God. Job was not that way. And not only was Job not that way, he was righteous, but God himself confirms and declares to Satan the righteousness of this man Job. In Job 1 and verse 8, The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Job is so unique because do you think that God would say that about you, would say that about me? I don't think God could say that, would say that about me. I don't believe that I come even close to Job, but God certainly said it about Job, a blameless and upright man fearing God and turning away from evil. What a marvelous testimony by God about this man, Job. And then when all looks good and when all looks well, Satan interjects his voice, this time not to Job, but to God. And the subject is about, maybe about God, but it's about how Job would react if God would react in a certain way. Satan accuses Job of fearing God because he is materially blessed. In Job 1 and verse 9, Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? In other words, is, is, he, is he fearing you because of his great respect and love for you and desire to please you above all? And then he says, Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has? On every side you have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. What is Satan doing here? Well, what Satan is saying is he admits the goodness of God. God, you've blessed him. You've blessed this man with so many material blessings. No wonder he's serving you because you're paying him to serve you. No wonder he still serves you. And at the same time, Satan claims that God is again paying Job to serve him by giving these material blessings. And he challenges and slanders Job. He challenges God by slandering Job and saying that Job is just serving you for what he can get out of it materially. That he does not fear and love you no matter what. He is just serving you now because he is so blessed. And that is the accusation of Satan untrue, but yet untested maybe, against Job. His faith has been bought. His faith has been paid for by material things that God has given. What does God do? God permits Satan to destroy Job's children and material blessings. Beginning in Job 1 and verse 12, Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. Now on the day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabines, the Sabines attacked and took them. They also slew the servants with the edge of the sword. 
and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid on the camels and took them and slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. One right after the other in rapid succession they come, and they tell Job all of these things, how his possessions and servants have been destroyed, and probably he could bear all of that but his ten children being destroyed by a violent wind that crushed their house of the oldest brother. How could that happen, all of it now? All of his possessions and all of his ten children have been destroyed. And what is Job's reaction? Bitterness against God, hatred against God, disbelief toward God? No. In Job chapter 1 and verse 20, this is his reaction. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. He didn't understand anything about Satan's role, but he did not blame God for what had occurred. Even though Satan was responsible, he did not blame God, but he thought maybe the Lord is involved with it. And in the fact that the Lord permitted these things to test the faith of Job, the Lord is involved with it, but the devil's work is the devil's work. And the destruction of his children, possessions, and servants, that is the direct work of Satan. And you would think after all of that, Job would turn against God, but he does not. God declares Job's righteousness again to Satan. In chapter 2 and verse 3, The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man fearing God and turning away from evil, and he still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him, to ruin him without cause. But he's still serving. But Satan's answer is that he's only serving God now and fearing God because he has good health. Even though he's lost his wealth, if you strike his health and he loses his health also, then he will let go of his faith and stop serving you. In Job 2 and verse 4, Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. However, put forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh. He will curse you to your face. And that's what we have. He is only serving you because he's got good health, whether he has possessions or not. And so Satan slanders Job again. Strike his health, 
and it will be all over. And God permits Satan to take away Job's health, but not to take away his life. And even though Job does not know the role of Satan behind his destruction of his health, he still clings to God, not understanding God's purpose, but still clings continuously to God. God permits Satan to destroy Job's health, but not take his life. In Job 2 and verse 6, so the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your power. Only spare his life. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a potsherd to scrape himself while he was sitting among the ashes terrible terrible pain from head to toe inflicted by Satan and in spite of that in spite of losing his children his wealth and his health Job continues to cling to God in Job chapter 2 and verse 9 then his wife said to him do you still hold fast your integrity Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. What a marvelous example of faith patient patience serving God in spite of excruciating and grievous trials that are precipitated by the slander and the work of Satan permitted by God but executed by Satan for the destruction of Job and his three friends come, and they agree pretty much with Satan, but they do it from a different angle. If you were good, you would be blessed. And now that you're not being blessed with health and wealth, then you must be the greatest sinner that has ever lived on the face of the earth, and God is punishing you. And that is what they say in Job 4 and verse 6 as an example. Is not your fear of God, your confidence, and the integrity of your ways, your hope? Remember now whoever perished being innocent, or where would the upright destroyed? According to what I have seen, those who plow iniquity and those who sow trouble harvest it. So they're just saying the righteous are blessed and the sinners suffer. If you are material blessed, materially blessed, then you're righteous. If you have no material blessings in health, then you're sinful. That is their simple, ungodly way of looking at that. But Job is a righteous man. He was righteous when he was rich and when he was healthy. And he's righteous when he is suffering, having his faith tested to see if he will be loyal to God or not. And that is the type of faith we must have, a faith that rejoices in prosperity and health and a faith that perseveres in sickness and in material blessings being taken away. And that is Job. In spite of all, he cling to faith in God. Not understanding that Satan, how destructive a part he was playing. But God allowed it so that Job's faith could be even made stronger by the trials that he faced. In Job 19 and verse 25, 
in spite of all of his suffering, Job insists that one day he will see God even after death. He says in Job 19 and verse 25, As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God, whom I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see, and not another. My heart faints within me. Job chooses to serve God whose approval that he seeks above all in spite of all of his terrible trials that Satan has heaped upon him for his destruction but for Job's testing of his faith. In Job 23 verses 10 through 12 but he know, Job says, but he knows the way I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot has held fast to his path. I have kept his way and not turned aside. I have not departed from the command of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. That is Job. What a wonderful faith, even in the midst of trials, great trials that we would buckle under. Job withstands, trusting God, not knowing the destructive work of Satan. And in the end, the Lord eventually restores Job's health, children, and wealth. Job served the Lord with a desire to please him above all not because he had material things or health, but because he loved and feared God. And that's where the false teachers today talk about, if you're righteous, God will bless you. Not always. Sometimes our faith will be tested to see if we will continue or if our faith is just shallow because we are blessed we're serving God. Job had no idea again about Satan's role, but in suffering, Job patiently trusted the Lord, and the Lord eventually restores the blessings. The question that we have is, do we serve the Lord desiring to please him above all, regardless of material blessings or good health? That is the challenge to us today. Job, with the help of God, met that challenge. And so can we. In Job 42 and verse 1, God restores the health and the children and the wealth of Job. Then Job answered the Lord and said, after God had talked to with Job about the working of the universe and nature, things that Job had no idea of how to understand, displaying God's power and wisdom and knowledge and presence above all. And if he has a purpose in the universe and nature, he has a purpose in allowing Satan, which he doesn't mention to Job, to heap suffering upon mankind that faith may be tested. In verse 2 of Job 42, Job says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that, that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear now, and I will speak. I will ask you, and you instruct me, and will you instruct me? I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye see, my eye sees you. Therefore, I retract, and I repent in dust and ashes. So Job humbles himself before the all-knowing 
all-present and all-powerful God who knows about the universe and nature and knows intimately about humanity and how to respond to humanity in the best ways that we might have faith in God. In verse 10 of Job 42, the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends and the Lord increased all that Job had twofold. Verse 13, he had seven sons and three daughters. And we close with that question, do we serve God for the material blessings and health that he provides or do we serve him whether we have those things and that health or not? It was the Apostle Paul about to be depart from this earth probably by a violent death brought about by the Romans against him. But among the last words that we have from the inspired apostle, 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. The Apostle Paul, who had been blessed at times with wealth and material things, and now at the end, might have had neither and at times had struggles with sickness and and deprivation of material things he said he served God for that which God would provide in the end that crown of righteousness that crown of righteousness is worth everything whether we are blessed at times with material things or our health that eternal life and glory is worth all the suffering that we may endure in this life. What have we learned in this? Satan accuses Job of fearing God because he is material blessed, materially blessed. And when those things are taken away by Satan, he still serves God. And then Satan accuses Job of fearing God because he has good health. And when that is taken away by Satan, Job still chooses to serve God because it's God's approval that Job seeks above all. That's why Job continued serving God. Why do we serve God today? Is Satan accusing us before God today he does you know if we try to serve him and have faith in him he does accuse us before God and how do we respond when our material things and health are taken away do we hold fast to God or do we turn against him these times are the trials that we face and we turn to God May we depend upon him, trust, and continue to obey him in spite of all that the devil may oppress us with. If you're here this morning and subject to the gospel invitation, we would encourage you to respond to that gracious gospel before it is ever too late. If you believe in Jesus, the Son of God, that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, is now seated at the right hand of God, ruling over heaven and earth, waiting for you to respond to that gospel so that you might be cleansed by his blood. Then, believing in him, repent of your sins, 
Change your mind about your sins. Confess him as the Son of God, that he and the Father and the Holy Spirit are God before men. Be immersed in water in the name of Jesus, baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins, so that you may be raised up by the power of God out of the water to walk in newness of life. That is how the Bible teaches that you become a child of God, by obedient faith in him, and after coming up out of the water, trusting in God to forgive you, he adds you together one by one into his saved body, his church, that we may work and glorify and be changed into his image by the apostles' teaching. And as we learn and love and obey the word of God, when we fall short as Christians, which we do so frequently, and we sin against God, let us turn back to God as he is instructed, not to be baptized again, but to repent and pray that the Lord may forgive us of our sins as Christians, that we may be brought back and restored by his grace through the blood of Jesus. If anyone is subject to that gracious invitation of the gospel, we would encourage all to respond today while time is given to us by a patient and loving and holy God, as we now draw our lesson for today to a close.